This is Ray Mosholder. We are back to I, Judas, by the late, well, I always say early, when they leave the earth before I do get to, and uh, so I would call her the early Taylor Caldwell. She's in heaven now, but she left us some heavenly books. Chapter 9, Coming Events Not understanding my patriotism, most of the disciples considered me an unbeliever, but Jesus himself turned aside their barbs and let me know that he held me as good as the others. You, Judah, have your mission like the rest and will be remembered long after many are forgotten. My mission, I said, is to free my people. His eyebrows arched. <laughs> your people, Judah, and pray, who are they? The Jews throughout Israel and the diaspora who would be free of Rome and the other people are not the people of Rome whom you despise also the victims of this tyranny? He was forever complicating things. Is it not clearly spoken by the prophets that the Messiah shall deliver Israel so that it shall triumph over the seventy nations? So would you replace the Roman tyranny with another? I care not about the others. And then more boldly, nor should the Messiah, Judah, Judah. He reproved me gently. How often must you be told that only God's will is important? All else is vanity. Even in his faded robe and worn sandals, he had the look of the king and that he surely was, even though he spurned the scepter, many would have given him. In the face of his indecision, the faith of the disciples and the people often flagged. Then he would perform some new wonder, which made all realize that he was truly the deliverer of Isaiah and the Son of Man. On the road from Jericho, we passed through the Valley of Kidron, intending to enter the holy city by the fountain gate. There was a goodly company at our backs. When the master turned toward the Siloam pool, just southeast of the city. Normally, he avoided the shrines where the ailing gathered, for he healed publicly with few exceptions, only to reveal his relationship to the Father. And so I had the feeling that he was up to something again. Now, as he approached the pool, he was predictably mobbed by the sick, waiting their turn in the water. Hearing the excited murmur of the crowd, a blind man raised his hands imploringly, crying out in a quaking voice, Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on this Son of Israel. For so Jesus was known to many who were not sure yet that he was the promised one, but he wanted not to offend him if he did prove himself the deliverer. Others in the multitude, hoping themselves to be healed, called on Josiah Bartimaeus to hold his peace. But Jesus peered over their heads and bade Andrew bring the man forward. Josiah threw away his cup and prostrated himself before the Lord. Son of David, he cried, 
tears streaming from his sightless eyes. My eyes would see the bright flowers and the blue skies, the beloved faces of my aging mother and father, for I have been blind from birth and have seen no man, nor in my mind can I fathom how I myself look, though my hands have gone over this countenance endless times. Peter, at his usual question, Who did sin, Master, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? This wasn't the first time Jesus had been asked to help somebody born blind, only the first time publicly. The Sadducees in the crowd turned up their noses in disgust, for they believed in no life but the present. But the Master replied, without affirming or denying reincarnation, Neither has this man sinned, nor his parents, that he should have been born thus, but that the works of God at the appointed time should be manifest through him. Since Josiah was now thirty years old, it seemed to me cruel that he should have gone sightless all these years, just so the master could use him as a sign. Josiah Bartimaeus, said the master, as if divining my mind, shall bear witness before all of the power of the Lord. The light of the world was about to deliver light to the blind. I saw the sneers of the Sadducees and Pharisees and scribes. They would see and still not believe, for to do so would overturn their comfortable world. Usually, Jesus healed with a word or a touch, but now he spat on the ground, made a clay of the spittle, and applied the moist mass to the eyes of the blind man. Josiah stood as still as a post. Do you feel that you will be cured? I have no doubt, son of God. Good, wash then in the pool and be healed. Andrew and Peter helped Josiah into the pool empty now because all the sick had crowded about Jesus, praying to be next. Josiah kneeled and laved his eyes with the water. And then, rubbing his eyes, he let out a jubilant cry. I see! I see! In his excitement, he began jumping up and down until he, I thought he might fall and do himself damage. But Andrew and Peter got him out of the pool and took him to the master. Jesus' aura was strong that day and his eyes piercing. You were healed, Josiah Bartimaeus, because you had faith. All the clay in the world without faith won't heal the bite of a mosquito. Josiah's hungry eyes drank in every sight. I bear witness that I was blind all my years until I was healed here today. The Pharisee Ezra, self-styled the truth watcher, said coldly out of the crowd, And who bears witness to you? Josiah's face clouded. I know not what you mean. I have sat by the pool twenty years, and none questioned my blindness. Why would I lie, sir? You have the devil in you, and we know well who put it there. For this healing, if it is such, has been done on the Sabbath day, when there is a ban on public activity. Jesus' eyes flashed. Ezra, 
If your ox fell into a pit and was suffocating, would you extricate him on the Sabbath? The Sabbath is God's and it is blasphemous to work on this day. God is more merciful than the Pharisees. For he made the Sabbath for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Pharisee shut out his lip, but the master coolly turned away, followed as usual by the crowd. What shall I do now? called Josiah, running after him. Enjoy your sight and deny me to no man. Two days later, as we camped on the Mount of Olives, above the Garden of Gethsemane, word came that the Pharisees planned to put the blind, blind men on trial and reveal Jesus as a charlatan. Somewhat troubled, I went to the Rabbi Gamaliel's home in the afternoon. He was praying in the garden but looked up with pleasure when he saw me. I'm glad to see you, said he, holding out his cheek, not only for yourself, but so that you can tell me more about the Galilean, whom they whisper is the Messiah. He is the Messiah. He fits the prophecies perfectly, except that he dallies about Rome. He is wise there or your firebrands would have him on the same cross as Judah the Galilean. There is no cross that can hold him. He shall reign forever, for he fits all the requirements of the King of Kings. We have enough kings, said Gamaliel dryly. He took me by the elbow. But excuse me for being a negligent host. Let us go to the study and where we can sip a Persian wine and sit and privately and talk. He led me from the flowered atrium to a small room with windows overlooking the splendid palace of Caiaphas and the palace of Herod. You have fine neighbors, I said. He smiled. Your father's house is but a short distance, which reminds me that your mother is back. I think you should call on her. I looked up eagerly. Did she ask after me? No, but her coming back suggests that she would mend the wounds. You are younger, Judah. Swallow your pride. But she is my mother. My sense of grievance asserted itself. He smiled. Even so, doesn't your master preach that to be to forgive is to be forgiven? I looked at him closely. You've been following it? His head inclined slowly. Since he was 12, it would appear, but go to your mother. Promise me that. I promised. We reclined comfortably facing each other over a table laden with wines from many countries. I would prefer a Judean wine, I said. Always the Patriot, Judah. Well, that is one request I can readily fill. He looked up slowly, the decanter poised over my cup. Is there any other request? Why, I asked, does the Sanhedrin concern itself with so slight a matter as healing at a healing pool? He frowned. Oh, it isn't slight. When you consider how sacred 
the Pharisees hold the Sabbath. But he saved a man's sight. It was like restoring a life. According to the law, he had no right on the Holy Sabbath even to pick a plum from a tree. But it was God's work. The temple decides what is God's work. And his eyes twinkled. This Sanhedrin decides the temple's work. Anna's family runs the temple and the Sanhedrin. I'd spoken too quickly and his red face reminded me soon enough of his position. He went on quickly before I could apologize. The Sanhedrin is evenly divided between the Sadducees and the Pharisees, and they're not quick to do Anna's bidding in all things. They've convened at his request to question the blind man and his parents. He held out a long finger. But they have not called your Jesus. My curiosity was piqued. And why is that? Because he has friends, even in the Sanhedrin. Pharisees who have an honest curiosity about this son of David and would know more about him before they pass judgment. My eyes studied that shrewd, jovial face. Not for nothing did they call him the owl. And they fear the thousands that follow him like the Messiah. I finished his thought. Who would, if he gave the word, take over the temple and the fortress Antonia? He chuckled in his beard. <laughs> he will never give the word, for he thinks too much of Israel. I looked at him questioningly. From all I hear, he's a very wise man. And wise men know there's a time and a place for everything. There was no point in discussing Roman arms and Roman might. May any but the blind attend this hearing of Josiah Bartimius? I asked. He didn't laugh. With your credentials, that shouldn't be too difficult. My credentials are secret. Oh, true. So observe as Gamaliel's guest, as one whose father was an elder of the court. Good. Then Jesus will not be summoned. Not if the healing is deemed valid. For it would be foolhardy to make an issue of the Sabbath at this time against a popular hero. He must be discredited first, and that hasn't happened. I was chilled by his cold logic. So calculating it seemed evil. I'm just looking at the situation through Anna's eyes, Judah. To achieve success, one must concern himself not so much with what people say or do, but with what they want. Now ask yourself what the old high priest wants. To stay in power. Everybody knows that. Exactly. So ask yourself, what would undermine this power? A rival power. Precisely. And what else? Trouble with the Romans? They gave me an embrace. You are indeed your father's son, Judah. Had only mentioned the obvious. 
but it is obvious that it eludes people. You should adopt the same approach to your master. I'm sure it would be illuminating. But of course you're too close to him to be dispassionate and too influenced by wishful thinking. He waved aside my objections. I shall see you in the morning. Remember, you are but an observer. As I left, I realized I hadn't even touched my wine. The court of hewn stone, where the Sanhedrin met, was nearly filled. Only a quorum of 23 was necessary in lesser trials, whereas in capital cases, a majority of the 70 was usually required. Sessions were customarily held on two successive days to assure the accused the fullest opportunity to reverse the outcome of the first hearing. As always, the law was more merciful than man. I saw many familiar faces in the chamber. Annas sat on a raised platform facing the tribunal. And slightly below sat the Nasi, the Reb Gamaleo. I took a seat in the back row of the windowless room, first showing a guard a pass signed by the Nasi. Near the prisoner's dock, I noticed Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea quietly waiting for the proceedings to begin. The charges were brought by the rabbi Ezra, but as the accuser, he couldn't be a witness. Caiaphas, the prosecutor, took his place at the head of a long table. Two witnesses were necessary, and since the accused was hardly a bona fide witness against himself, I wondered who the others might be. With a start, I recognized the disciple Cestus, who I remembered now had been in the company that day. He was my responsibility since I named him and Dismas and Joshua Bar Abbas as well, after they'd shown some interest in using this cloak to cover their activities for the cause. From time to time, I received reports of their forays and wondered whether I'd done the right thing. I confronted myself with the thought that they were toiling in the vineyard of the Lord, spreading Christ's word, even as they were collecting weapons and other material for the final judgment. But now I wasn't sure seeing the recklessness in Cestus. Two others sat across from him at the witness table. An elderly couple, obviously of the working classes, for the needles in the man's rough cloak proclaimed him a tailor. They appeared uneasy, their eyes showing their awe of Annas in his shimmering gold and white robes. The charges were of the flimbious, flimsiest sort, that Josiah had conspired to break the Sabbath, then perjured himself in the bargain. What kind of charge was this? Obviously, it was nothing but a ruse to get at Jesus. Josiah Bartimaeus was the first witness. He stepped forward timorously and stood on the witness stand, his hands nervously grasping the rail. Caiaphas approached him slowly. Your name, he asked in a tone he would have reserved for a dung heap. Josiah barely had time to reply. Your occupation. Josiah's face 
showed bewilderment. I, I have none. I've been blind from birth. It was all I could do to restrain a chuckle. The prosecutor thundered, Mind your tongue, man, and answer only the questions. Josiah looked about helplessly, no doubt, wondering how it had helped to gain his sight. Yes, sir, prosecutor. And you live where? On the road to Jericho? With my parents. He pointed his hand in his eagerness to please. They're at the table, sir. And so that explained the elderly couple. Explain what you were doing at the Pool of Siloam. Seeking alms, sir, as is the custom of the poor and the blind. Caiaphas looked at him contemptuously. But why this particular place when it would have been easier to do your begging closer to home? Josiah has shown across the chamber. I hoped for a miracle, sir. A miracle! <laughs> Caiaphas pounced on the word. What kind of miracle? That which takes place in the healing waters. How long have you sat at the pool? Some twenty years. And you've been in the waters many times. And you weren't healed? No, sir. Did you know anybody else that was healed? Only by what they told me. For I couldn't see for myself. There were some titters among the Pharisees. The prosecutor reacted angrily. Never mind what you could see. That is what this examination is about. Josiah smiled inanely. Whatever you say, sir. Caiaphas spoke very deliberately now, as if to give the question new importance. How did you still hope for a miracle when there'd been none all these years? The witness's eyes glistened. They were hazel eyes, and they held a look of constant surprise, as if the owner couldn't get over the shock of what everything looked like. Because I had heard of a man greater than John the Baptist, who is doing all manner of healing, even bringing the dead back to life. And who is this man? Josiah shrugged. Some called him the Deliverer. Others said he was the son of David, the rod of Jesse promised by the ancient prophets. And how knew you of these prophecies? Blind as you were from birth, Caiaphas' eyebrows arched mockingly. The words gushed out. My good parents are pious Jews of the Pharisee persuasion who read me from the prophets from childhood. I could see the satisfied smiles among the Pharisees. Even so, said Caiaphas, why would this son of David, as you call him, single you out? My dear parents have always told me when I despaired that I must keep faith and not question God's will. I myself had questioned the master's choice of this man, but I saw now he must have been chosen for this occasion. Sooner or later, Caiaphas had to get to the reasoning for the hearing. What claims did this man make? None. What did he call himself? The others called him master. 
but he claimed nothing. Did you not call him the son of David? Only because I overheard the others. Did he not say that he was a prophet? Josiah hesitated. When asked, he merely nodded. Didn't you take this for consent? He, he must surely have been a prophet. For how else could he have healed me? This cure, you speak of. Tell the court how this was done. Josiah repeated how Jesus had made the clay and placed it on his eyes. I washed then in the pool and could see. For a moment, Caiaphas looked like the cat that swallowed the dove. Had any ever been healed in this pool? He asked again. A as I said, sir, I know only what I've heard. Then there have been some. Not that I could tell with my own eyes. I could see the prosecutor's exasperation mounting. But there were healings or you would not have heard. Is that not correct? I wouldn't swear to it, sir. For I, Caiaphas, cut him off angrily. Where are you aware of the day on which you were presumably healed? You mean when my sight was restored? The day that the son of David, as you put it, violated the law. Josiah was now plainly confused. I, I, I know of no law that was broken. Were you not aware that this was done on the Sabbath? I didn't think of it, sir. Were you not aware that it is sinful to participate in any public function on the Sabbath, even to wash, for that matter? Josiah's face dropped. But uh, others were in the pool. That doesn't excuse you. Until now, the rabbi Gamaliel had followed the proceedings silently. Are you questioning that this man was healed? He asked. Caiaphas turned to him in annoyance. Since it is a sin to labor on the Sabbath, then this man Josiah and the other must be sinners. How can a sinner perform such a miracle? Gamaliel's wise old eyes twinkled. In truth, that is the crux of it. Can a sinner perform such a miracle? Caiaphas too late saw the trap he had set himself. I smiled at the scowl on Anna's face. If I may say a word, Anna's held out a well-manicured hand it seems to me that evidence for a miracle hinges on a proof that this man was sightless from birth. Gamaliel nodded approvingly, and for that reason we've summoned the parents of this man. At this point, an unusual interruption occurred. A temple guard, greatly agitated, slipped into the chamber and spoke and, uh, intimately to the high priest. Annas listened with a solemn face, then beckoned Caiaphas. They conversed for a few moments and the guard withdrew. There was a rustle of curiosity in the room, but the hearing continued, as if there had been no interruption, save for a certain abstraction on Anna's part. First, I would call a disciple of this Jesus of Nazareth. It might have served more purpose. Let me give that a new voice. 
it might have served more purpose to have called the Nazarene himself. Caiaphas shot him a resentful look. The independent witness is always better than the one witnessed. Proceed with your independent witness, said the Nazi. Sister's eyes roamed the courthouse boldly, stopping when they came to me. He seemed startled and gulped nervously, but still stepped firmly into Josiah's place. Caiaphas spoke more confidently now. You are a disciple of this Jesus? Sestis nodded. I am. Do you believe in him? I do. Did you see him heal this Josiah Bartimius? I did. Had you any way of knowing this man was blind? Only that he said so. Ha! A gleam came to the crafty eyes. Only that he said so. Did you have doubts of the healing? None whatsoever. It was more and more confusing. And why was that? Because I had seen miracles as great. Even to healing a verminous leper before my very eyes. Then this Jesus is the prophet he claims to be. Cestus shook his head grimly. Oh, he's more than a prophet. When I heard that he changes water to wine and walks on the sea, I knew that he was the anointed of Israel, the deliverer, the Messiah we have waited for. Caiaphas strutted before the Nazi. You see, we deal here with a more dangerous situation than we thought. I groaned at the foolhardiness of this overzealous zealot. He was so misguided as to border on treachery. You fool, you unadulterated fool, I thought. But help came from an unexpected source. This testimony, said Anna severely, is only opinion. I could see a semblance of surprise in Caiaphas's eyes, and even a dent in Gamaliel's habitual control. And for this reason, Annas went on, it's not admissible at this time. The witnesses dismissed, there are no more witnesses. But the Rabbi Gamaliel was not to be disappointed. Let us not forget the parents of the accused. They should be heard before the tribunal arrives at any verdict. Annas grudgingly has acceded. It was necessary to call only the father, since a woman's testimony could not contradict her husband. Timius was a simple tailor, a God-fearing man who subscribed to the Pharisee and belief in a world hereafter. Gamaliel, with a look to Annas, asked in a mild tone, with the Sadducee's mind, if this Pharisee asked a few questions of this devotee of the Pharisee teaching. Not at all, said Annas. The Pharisees have equal voice in the deliberations of this court. Gamaliel's questions were gently probing. This Josiah is your son. Overall, overawed, Timaeus coughed nervously. <coughs> yes, by my good wife. Now, was this son blind? 
until healed by the man known as Jesus. I didn't see the healing, so I can't vouch for it except as I learned it from my son. Was your son able to see it all? He was totally blind. Did you consult physicians? Well, even the Egyptian and Greek physicians, but to no avail. He was born without an optic nerve. A murmur of disbelief rippled through the room. How could he see even now without an optic nerve? That's not possible. Timaeus bowed his head. So the physician said, and so we lost hope. He looked up for a moment and his eyes gleamed. It was a miracle, nothing else. How do you explain it? I have not seen this Jesus of Nazareth, but my son tells me there's a luminescence about him that defies description. But how does a mere man perform such a miracle? He was surely sent by God. God listens, not to sinners. But if any man be a worshiper of God and does his will, him he listens to. There was a dead silence in the chamber and then a rising crescendo of wrath. Caiaphas rose angrily to his feet. Who are you to preach to us, old man? Josiah rushed to his father's aid. My father speaks the truth. This man was surely sent by God. Caiaphas burst into a towering rage. You were born in sin. Dare lecture the temple chiefs in your abysmal ignorance. Away with you before we clap you in chains. Do we put this matter to a vote? Interposed Gamaliel in his most urbane style. The high priests exchange covert glances, and I could see Annas barely wag his head. These are such clods, said the prosecutor, that it would be absurd to consider their testimony. For this reason, I recommend no determination at this time. Annas nodded his agreement. It was a surprising development, but the matter still hung over Jesus' head. That was clear. The rabbi Gamaliel quickly joined in the dismissal. For the sake of the community, we accept the prosecutor's recommendation. I chased after Cestus in the hall. What foolishness is this? I demanded. His manner was surly. Something is needed to wake him up. If his enemies name him the Deliverer, then he must deliver to save Israel and himself. Careful, this borders on treason. The man is for Israel, not Israel for the man, said he, turning around what the master had said about the Sabbath. I looked for Joseph and Nicodemus, but they'd slipped out a back door. I soon found out why. At the front door, I recognized the guard who had spoken to Annas earlier. He made us a low obeisance. Go out at your own risk. The people have gone mad. I reached for the latch. We have nothing to fear from the people. For, said Cestus, we are the people. An astounding sight greeted us. 
the court of Gentiles was jammed solid with people. They stood heads bared without a sound. Some carried swords and spears. Others had raised standards which said, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. I knew now why there had been no resolution of the trial. From his dealings with the Romans, Annas had learned long ago that he who mixes discretion with valor lives to fight another day. The throng was well controlled and orderly, yet it conveyed a greater threat than any undisciplined mob. In the forefront I saw Simon the Zealot. He brandished his sword in one hand and a spear in the other. Obviously he didn't believe they who live by the sword die by the sword. This was not a helpless mass of pilgrims. My eyes traveled to the fortress towers. The red cloaked Roman soldiers stood in full battle array, but there were no mocking smiles today. They were tense, quietly ready, as the legions always are, but even though their commander stood among them, his skull gleaming in the midday sun, no command came. Pilate was too much of a diplomat. Rome couldn't tolerate one massacre, but two in such rapid succession might indicate an uneasy hold on the reins of government. And this was a crowd of a different temper. Cestus held up an arm in a victory salute. Jesus, he said, was vindicated here today. A deafening roar as of one man arose from the throng. You see, said Cestus, with a wave to the grinning Simon Salutus, how easy it is. A sense of disquietude came over me at this moment of apparent triumph. I looked up again at the tower, at the tall, commanding figure in the garb of Rome. There was a smile on his face. And next time, chapter 10, this should be interesting, Mary of Magdala. Remember her in the Bible? Look her up. Good thing to get that Bible going. God bless you, and I'll be back for chapter 10 the next time we read this book.